Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Georgia Climate Project webinar. My name is Leslie Townsell, um, and I am a graduate student working with the Georgia Climate Project this semester. So who is GCP, the Georgia Climate Project? We are a partnership of nine universities in Georgia. Um, we would like to thank um, individual donors and our major funders. So what do, um, we have to answer two questions. That is our goal. What does a claim, uh, changing climate mean for Georgia and what can we do about it? Um, and in order to answer these questions, we have built um, an information portal and you can visit this on our website. So this webinar today is part of a series um, which are all available on the GCP website as well as YouTube. So we also have the Georgia Climate Project stories. Um, and this has been, we've been working to create uh, these stories to highlight the lives, uh, the livelihoods of Georgians and Georgia and Georgia impacted by climate change. So to check out our website, you can, I'm, I'm sorry, to check out our Georgia Climate Stories, please head over to our website. So we have one more webinar coming up in this series and it's what does a, clean, a changing climate mean for Georgia's infrastructure? And that's gonna take place on May 26th. Follow us on social media, follow, like, and subscribe um, with the hashtag GCP webinar. We will be live tweeting this event today. And just a reminder that we have a call for posters out. The Georgia Climate Conference hosted by the Georgia DNR is, uh, has a call for posters due June 1st and there's registration starts uh, in a few days. So many of us are very familiar with Zoom. Um, today we are in a webinar, so your audio and visual have been turned off. Uh, in order to talk, please use the chat or the Q&A, which you can see down at the bottom of your screen. After uh, the webinar is over, you will receive an email with a link to an evaluation survey. Please fill it out and let us know how we did today. So today we have our webinar, Equity and Justice in a Changing Climate in Georgia. Um, and with all those housekeeping details out of the way, I think we're ready to kick things off. And I would like to turn this over to Ms. Felicia Davis. Uh, good morning, everyone. And I am trying to switch over to have my remarks, which have disappeared. So here we go. So good morning, and I'm excited to moderate this session, Justice and Equity in a Changing Georgia Climate. It's a conversation that has been years in the making and long overdue. My, my paternal grandmother was from Madison, Georgia, and she lived 100 years from 1892 until 1992. She was the greatest environmentalist that I've ever known. She wasted nothing, not food, water, materials, time, money, not even words. She had a garden with both flowers and vegetables and always a compost pile. She moved to New Jersey during the Great Migration, fueled by threats from terroristic whites. In 1982, Dr. Ben Chavis, and I think we have an old photo of him. Dr. Ben Chavis coined the term environmental racism. Oh, oh excuse me. Uh, now I'm looking not at my notes, but um, at a lovely photo, which I didn't expect Hold on. But anyway, he, he coined the term in environmental racism and um, when he was thrown in jail for, if that could go off the screen, it would really help me. Um, uh, when he was thrown in jail for protesting the, dump, the dumping of toxic cancer-causing PCBs in a rural black 
farming community. So not only dumping it where people are, but where people are actually farming. 10 years later in 1992, we had the police beating of Rodney King that generated the chant, no justice, no peace. 10 years after that, before black, black bodies floated face down after Hurricane Katrina, I co-authored Air of Injustice. Um, and that report examined the impact of power plant pollution and climate change on black communities. One uh, moment. Oops. So uh, there's the report. Still which, working. Uh, this is not working well. Anyway, so in 2002, we had the Arab Injustice Report. And that report, um, following it, also climate justice activists and environmental uh, justice activists came together. Sorry, I couldn't hear what you said. I don't understand what's going on. Um, Lindsay, if you could take away the um, PowerPoint, please. Thank you. And I'm not sure why I'm, um, there's like a little, I think that's Siri bumping in. But anyway, the um, challenges of Zoom. So anyway, but environmental justice activists and climate justice advocates came together to focus on energy efficiency, renewable energy, conservation policies, and certainly equity for communities most affected by climate change. And that was really, um, in my mind, an important moment. 10 years after that, 2012, we have Trayvon Martin and murdered by George Zimmerman and Obama was reelected. Night, not quite, 10 more years have passed. And we have George Floyd uh, the, with the racial justice reckoning, the movement to make life, Black Lives Matter, and an effort by climate justice experts to finally and forcefully connect the dots. So now, as long as there's been life on Earth, the climate has been changing. So climate change really is not the problem. Destroying the natural habitat on which all life depends, problem. Wasteful depletion of non-renewable resources, especially fossil fuels, and overexploitation of renewable resources, problem. Rapidly growing gap between rich and poor people and nations, large-scale unemployment and poverty, problem. Dangerous powers unleashed by modern science and technology, nuclear chemical gene, problem. Uh, and above all, the breakdown in the moral fiber of society, the breakup of social cohesion, and the growth of conflict potential with the proliferation of more devastating weaponry. Huge problem. So now, how do we communicate climate research, advocacy, and policy when the fact that my mask protects you and your mask protects me is rejected by a large segment of society. Not to mention that we must pay our youth to get vaccinated when Haiti has no vaccine, India doesn't have enough, and a pandemic which, like climate change, makes all of us invested in global solutions problem. This is the state of America. And this is why many of us declare that our problem is not climate, but justice. It is imperative that we get knees off next and restore appreciation for science if we are to truly advance the climate agenda. For once, Wikipedia has a definition that I like, climate justice. Climate justice is a term used to frame global warming as an ethical and political issue, rather one that is purely environmental or physical in nature. This is done by relating the causes and effects of climate change to concepts of justice, particularly environmental justice and social justice. We must also define justice. For me, it means where there are harms, they are repaired where there are opportunities, special effort is made to ensure that those excluded in the past are now included. Treat everyone the way that wealthy white people are treated, with respect, voices that are included and listened to. Justice requires that people that matter the least now matter the most. 
Equity is a tough one because it runs a bit against capitalism as we know it. But equity requires a true leveling of the field. Communities of color, especially black and indigenous communities have experienced long stretches of divestment and extraction. We deserve massive investment, starting with education so that we might avoid the pitfall of consumption and create thriving regenerative communities. Diversity and inclusion are closely related. Diversity means that multiple pr perspectives must be present. And inclusion means bringing those diverse voices to the table to participate in the conversation where it matters. As you listen to our distinguished panelists, I want you to think about how your work connects to the issues and communities represented. How are you helping to increase diversity and inclusion? How are you prioritizing justice in your work? What suggestions do you have for promoting equity? How can you contribute to the deployment of the Justice 40 investment in Georgia? Along the coast are farms, urban areas, rivers, lakes, and water supply. Mitigation, adaptation, resilience, preparedness, research, collaboration, education, advocacy, the list goes on, but let's get started. Each presenter will introduce herself, her work, and a brief presentation. Leading off, we have the illustrious Dr. Mildred McLean. Dr. McLean? Good morning. Let's see. Am I in with my video? Okay, let's see. Okay, here I am. Can you hear me, Doc? Dr. Felicia, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, good, 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 good. Good morning, everybody. And I want to just thank everybody for being present this morning and accounted for because where we are in our history, uh, all hands on deck, all boots on the ground. Uh, before I get started, I would be remiss in my duty if I didn't ask for all of us on the panel, as well as those in the audience, to just give a few seconds of silence to the Wright family in Minnesota, as well as the residents of Minnesota and those families who have lost loved ones to the COVID pandemic and syndemic. Thank you so much for that. I really don't have too much to add because Dr. Davis really hit the ball out of the park with identifying where we are, identifying some of our major challenges and certainly identifying the major problems. I am uh, Dr. Mildred McLean, as she said, I'm the executive director of the Harambe House located in Savannah, Georgia. And I'm also a just energy organizer with the Partnership for Southern Equity. And I've probably been in the movement, oh, six decades plus. And um, I'm excited to be in this final quarter uh, looking back over what has been accomplished over the last 30, 40, 50 years in terms of equity and justice. And I dare say I'm having a problem identifying my victories, uh, but nevertheless, the movement continues. The question is looking at equity and justice in a changing climate in Georgia. And often when we think of climate change today, we focus on weather related events uh, and we actually talk about the climate and the global warming. But in addition to that, it is important for us at this time in 2021 to look at the political and the moral climate in this country. We dare not forget January the 6th, when mutiny on the bounty or an insurrection or a coup attempt uh, actually was launched in this country between the right wing, the white supremacists, and elected officials uh, in our government. Uh, yes, I said it. There is a conspiracy, a conspiratorial climate 
that's going on, a repressive and oppressive and suppressive uh, environment, climate that we find ourselves in. Every time we look around, there is another black man or woman, brown man or woman, indigenous man or woman killed at the hands of the police or killed at the hand of somebody whose behavior and moral compass has been compromised. And so we cannot just focus on climate change as it relates to the increase of heat and the increase of cold and the breaking down of icebergs and the, the, the increased intensity of storms and hurricanes and flooding. But we have to look at the climate that we live in where uh, the governor of Georgia signed a bill to further repress the vote and the voting access and our human right to being able to go to the poll and voice our opinion and to choose who we want to represent us. I live in Savannah. I've been living in a floodplain since I was three years old and hardly nothing has been done about it. It's only been exacerbated by the intense storms that come through here uh, during hurricane season. And yes, we do try to get ready, get ready, get ready, but we never seem to be ready enough because we always lose property, life, and we increase the mental uh, trauma that our people go through. Because when you got to evacuate because of Hurricane Katrina or Hurricane Matthew or Hurricane whoever is pressing down on you and you find yourself uh, stuck on Highway 16 trying to get out of Savannah to Atlanta to a hotel that's going to overcharge you and food and gas that's going to be gouged on your way. I'm sorry that I'm, I might be off topic this morning, but you see my heart is heavy because I done spent the last 60 plus years of my life trying to change uh, the white supremacist policies and practice and I find myself right smack dab in the middle of them. So what do I say to young people who say, well, doc, you don't been in this 60 years and what can you see as a change? And I say, I don't know. Uh, but nevertheless, we have to still try it on. So what is it about this fight? This, this, we are looking for this transformation in our country, but we haven't figured out how to pull it off because we still are trying to convince people who have been elected to represent us and to create policies that enter the side of the people, we still trying to convince them that climate change ain't no hoax. And all the science and research and reports and documents that we have had in the last 20, 30 years, even Bill Gates son came out and said something, wrote a book about it, but we still find ourselves in the same situation. No justice, no peace, no equity, no voting, what is going on in this country? So we have to go into a reflective mode. So I'm inviting everybody to go into a reflective mode and figure out what we done done wrong so we can correct it and move a little bit more strategic in 2021. We got to fight the suppression of the vote because if we don't have control of the legislation, legislature, we can't pass legislation that is a policy erring to our side. We can't call for them for, to include mandatory emergency preparedness response for every neighborhood in the state of Georgia and the state of the United States. We cannot call for uh, resiliency hubs to be placed in every neighborhood in the state of Georgia and throughout the United States. I know my time is coming to a close, but I just wanted to bring your focus to, to this low hanging fruit which is we have to call for emergency preparedness response training on the residential level where they can work with their local agencies to respond to all of these climate changes and impacts due to the weather. Now listen here, Savannah's in a unique position because we right at the mouth of a major port we right on the Atlantic Ocean, but we're also 125 miles downstream from the Savannah River site, which is a former nuclear weapons production site in the Department of Energy 13 federal facility complex. So anything that happens up there will happen down here. You remember in 1991, that tritium spill came all the way down to Savannah from Aiken, South Carolina. 
So as the weather changed, they told us that there would never be an earthquake over near the Savannah River site. Yet in Granite, South Carolina, there was an earthquake. So we got to be cognizant of the neighbors to these federal facilities. We've got to put in places strategies that will help them respond to these climate changes. We've got to look out for the rural and coastal communities, and we've got to arm our people with information, strategies, tools, and skills so that they can continue this fight. Thank you so much. I appreciate y'all. Thank you, Dr. McClain. And um, that, that was um, quite a lot to take in. And next we have uh, Dr. Shafi, who uh, is from Spelman. Dr. Shafi. Good morning, everyone. It's very tough to go after Dr. McLean. She is such an iconic speaker. Uh, I'm going to do my best. Uh, and um, as uh, we uh, talk about environmental justice, we know that environmental justice really define environment way broader than the uh, traditionalist, the traditional environmentalists have defined it because the environmental justice activists uh, define environment where we live, where we work, where we play, where we study and what, where and how we eat. We also see the environmental justice movement not in silo, but we see it as a merging of three movements, um, the, the civil rights movement, economic and social justice movement, and then environment movement. So it's very important as um, Dr. McLean just said, to look at it from a holistic approach rather than compartmentalize it and uh, view it from uh, different silos. Um, so, uh, Dr. Bullard uh, famously says that all communities are not uh, created equal. So let us start with the nexus between the uh, pandemic and the toxic legacy of environmental racism or environmental injustices. Um, and then you will see that um, climate change is also saying that, uh, yes, uh, when these crises come, um, we are Okay. So we are supposedly impacted the same, but many of us cannot um, uh, pay our way to safety. Um, as, um, and that is why um, I have a problem with us referring to communities as vulnerable communities. Because the fact is that vulnerability is not in the DNA of these communities, but rather it is the imprint and legacy of decades of toxic policies, practices, laws, and rhetorics uh, that and the, the insidious uh, consequences of these uh, decades of rhetorics, laws, and policies and norms have created vulnerabilities that put the environmental justice communities at the greater risk from either pandemic or climate change. And I think COVID-19 definitely was not, once it rolled in, showed that it wasn't as equalizer as we were talking about, because even though um, the data is not completely here, we know that it disproportionately infa infected and also killed um, communities of color and low income. And uh, I think that another uh, indicator is that the dis when you look at the disparities in COVID record of infections and death, then you will see that uh, it is just exposing the decades of willfully blind policies and practices that subjected these communities to the disparate, uh, to the hazardous and substandard living and working condition. Um, so, and I really think that uh, in order to understand the challenges that uh, COVID or climate uh, have for um, 
our communities, uh, it, we need to recognize the history. We need to better understand these uh, decades of injustices that have been inflicted on these community, that th these policies, these practices, these rhetorics, these norms created, sustained, and perpetuated these vulnerabilities and uh, really distributed, allocated, withheld opportunities and risk. And I really uh, think that in order to understand it, we really need uh, to look at this moment uh, with the lens of uh, not so much of a digital clock that freezes us into moment and not seeing the past or the present, but rather using the analog clock, clock where it shows where the hands were before, and where the hands are now and where the hands will go. So I think that um, that is critical because what we see with the climate or pandemic, we see that the uh, default is continuously focusing at the moment rather than trying to find out the root causes of these vulnerability. As I said, vulnerability is not in the DNA of these people and these communities. It is the imprint of the policies. It is the imprints of these uh, practices. Um, and in order to really address these issues, we need to understand, confront this, the embedded history of vulnerability. And I, I if you, if you look at it, uh, when I say DNA is not really, um, it's vulnerability is not in the DNA of the folks, is that even as recently, there was a study by Robert Wood Johnson Foundation that affirmed what uh, Deputy Secretary of HUD said many, many, um, a few decades ago, which is um, the zip code is a best indicator of life expectancy. And, and he said that really zip code should be an address, not a lifetime health uh, determinant for people as it is currently. So uh, what I think that we need to uh, look at is that um, how the disparity in the ferocity of policing and enforcement of minor offenses in the environmental justice communities really contrast with the lax enforcement of environmental laws. Uh, so it, it is, there, there is a, uh, I think, mismatch. Um, I, I appreciate this kind of dialogue and it really has values and are helpful but it's not necessarily going to lead to solution. We need resources to flow to these communities. We need the uh, voices and vision of these community given, be given authority and resources uh, to address it. We really need to understand the past as even now there are studies that are coming and showing the link between urban, higher uh, urban heat and the legacy of redlining. There is a study by the um, Bank of Chicago showing the economic um, toll of the redlining even now uh, on the property values of the folks. So, um, so we really need to, again, go back and look at all of these and uh, and see what is it that uh, we need to do. Because one of, the, in her famous speech, uh, Toni Morrison in 1975 uh, captured that, um, that it is really what happened is that racism is, is, is depriving people from doing the work because they keep trying to explain what is it causing. So, um, to this community and that's happening every day. I have been in the environmental justice movement for now more than 30 years 
and all I go to different forums, all I hear is about what is going wrong. I mean, uh, we all know the story. Let's now focus on the solution. We know with the climate that no country, whether rich or poor, uh, will be immune to the adverse impact of climate. But we know that the risks associated with climate are, are not uniform. Uh, as I said, many people can pay their way to safety, but not all. Tri threat of climate does not operate um, uh, in a silo independent of other vulnerabilities. The poorest countries are the most impacted and also the low income and communities of color are disproportionately impacted. So the, the entrenched inequity of climate change is the poster child of the uh, displaced hardship. And as the UN says that this is the, uh, you know, adaptation apartheid, they, they use the word. Uh, so, um, and the disparity in terms of effects of climate shocks and uh, also uh, uh, vulnerability. Uh, so the climate change, and then also we should be mindful of not treating climate change as an, just an environmental issue, as Dr. McLean said, it is a human rights issue. It's a social economic equity issues. It is all of these uh, issues combined. We saw that uh, with the COVID, we, uh, virus don't know, um, you know, viruses don't know your uh, ethnicity. They don't know your skin color. But what happens is that uh, we saw that it really impacted the community. Just a quick um, a word about, uh, let's look, look at the recent history with the Flint. Flint, the people's water was switched in April 2014 to Flint River. And then people started complaining. That complaint was dismissed by the uh, public official, later by the head of water at EPA, Region 5, and then eventually um, on October, GM switches water from Flint because it damages its um, engine, yet the city forces people to still use that water for another year. It is not till October 2015 that finally the water source is switched. And even till March 2016, people are made to pay for that poisonous water. And then in the midst of the um, pandemic, the administration rolls back the environmental laws that are supposed to protect because of COVID. And um, we see that the, that was a, another slap in the face. I'm gonna stop right now and uh, wait for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sharpe. So uh, next up, we have Dr. Osborne Jelks, who will take us into the urban arena. Thank you so much, Felicia. And um, it, it is definitely always a hard act to follow Dr. McLean and Dr. Shafi, but I will do my best, um, as has already been said. So what I'd like to do is to connect some dots. Um, we've We've started off talking um, really about the ways that we cannot disassociate climate change and activism and action to address climate change from action to address social and environmental injustices. And so what I will talk about will continue on that theme, but let me kind of bring it to, um, to Atlanta. Dr. McLean has taken us to the coast. Let me talk a little bit about some of the urban impacts and some of the challenges faced in urban centers like Atlanta. 
while the top climate hazards um, will look differently um, across the state of Georgia, um, there has been some modeling and studies that have predicted what will likely be those top climate hazards um, as we reach the year 2050 um, in different locations. And so as we look to Atlanta, um, those top climate hazards are things like increased precipitation, warming, water deficit, drought, and heat waves. And as we think about climate change as this existential threat um, that ha has already um, had impacts and will continue to have impacts on uh, both current and future generations as we think about it from a global scale um, and then bring it to Georgia um, and to various locations throughout the state, um, we again cannot address climate change <clears throat> as just an issue about the natural environment. It has undeniable implications for social justice and for human rights. Um, and as we think about those top climate hazards, um, we can think about things like the fact that already since 1970 um, in the city of Atlanta, if we look from 1970 to 2020, we, we have experienced about 20 more days, more warm spring days um, with above normal temperatures um, in, by the year 2020 than we did in 1970. With those, um, um, with more spring days comes a longer growing season. Um, we see a longer allergy season, which obviously impacts people who are uh, sensitive to things like pollen, um, but it also impacts people who might already have some sorts of respiratory um, issues uh, or illnesses. Um, as we look at the data, it's also shown us that we um, have since 1970, between 1970 and, and 2018, um, that we've seen about 22 more days with temperatures above 90 degrees. Um, I also attended um, a workshop just on yesterday um, with the SETS convergence at Georgia State University um, in which the, the data and modeling that they were showing um, also talked about the number of days um, above 100 degrees that we will expect to see um, between now and the year 2020, uh, 2050, excuse me. And so as we think about those things and we think about the climate change impacts from a health perspective, then we've got to think about those communities and populations who have been made to be most vulnerable to climate change impacts. And Dr. Shafi, I think um, really shaped that conversation well with respect to the imprint of policies and practice and how those are the things, institutionalized racism, those are the things that have made certain communities a lot more vulnerable. And so the reality is from the perspective of climate change impacts that none of us will be able to escape the impacts. Um, all of us will be impacted um, by uh, from a health perspective, from an economic perspective, from an environmental perspective, as we think about um, climate change impacts. Um, but the reality is that we are all in the same storm, but we're not all in the same boat. And so we've got to talk about exposure, sensitivity, um, ability to adapt, and how that also feeds into vulnerability for certain communities. When we think about exposure, we're talking about contact between people or communities to one or more biological, psychosocial, chemical, or physical stressor, including stressors um, affected by climate change. When we think about sensitivity, we're talking about um, the degree to which people or communities are affected either um, adversely or, or even if there were some beneficial impacts to exposure um, to um, climate climate variability or climate change. And then with respect to the ability to adapt, we've got to look at the adaptive capacity and ability of communities and institutions or people to adjust to potential hazards such as climate change um, to take advantage of opportunities um, to be able to respond. And what we've already heard today is that that ability to adapt, the ability to respond has been greatly impacted by policies and procedures, um, by policies and practices, um, not only throughout the throughout the country, but also in the state of Georgia. We can look um, to things like what is happening um, with respect to um, voter suppression. Um, and I think Lindsay and Chandra will talk a little bit more more about, you know, kind of the, um, you know, things like the Public Service Commission and how we need to take certain tools and levers um, to impact policy in a positive way. 
But as we think about how um, these factors lead to vulnerability and lead to different sorts of health outcomes, we ha also have to look at the various climate drivers, exposure pathways, health impacts, and then health outcomes. If we think about the impacts of climate change combined with exposure to things like poverty um, and racial discrimination, from a health perspective, then we're looking at people in poor neighborhoods and communities of color um, being more exposed to climate change health, uh, climate change uh, health threats. When we think about climate drivers, as well as the sensitivity with respect to underlying health conditions, we could also talk, especially in urban areas, about the underlying conditions of inadequate infrastructure. Um, when we think about um, the, the climate hazard of uh, precipitation, um, more precipitation, um, we can also think about the ways that the inadequate infrastructure that we already experience in urban communities like Atlanta are impacting communities um, from the perspective of urban flooding, um, which leads to a number of health concerns, risks, and threats. When we think about um, sensitivity, we know that people with chronic medical conditions are more likely to be um, to have serious health problems during things like um, these heavy flooding and storming events. Um, these are folks who are going to have um, more health problems in a heat wave. Um, and so when we look at those health outcomes, again, these factors that are shaping vulnerability are going to be very, very important. As I begin to, to close, let me just kind of um, highlight a couple of things that impact urban areas in particular. So Dr. Shafi already talked about toxic po policies, um, the way that um, communities are impacted um, by our disproportionate exposure in many cases to hazardous and toxic waste. Dr. Robert Bullard, who has been called by many to be um, the father of the environmental justice movement, um, has said that the South has a legacy of unequal protection. Why would the environment be any different? And as we look at studies, um, one study um, that is several years old, um, dates back to 2012, called the Patterns of Pollution. It looks at demographics and pollution sources in a 14 county metropolitan Atlanta area. And within this study, it was found that there are 52 environmental justice hotspots, meaning locations where there are multiple pollution sources um, and there is those multiple pollution sources are overlaying with social vulnerabilities. We're talking communities of color, low income communities, as well as language isolated communities. This and other studies have shown that, um, that people of color um, are, are, are living in communities that are most likely to be impacted by environmental, um, environmentally unwanted land uses and toxic waste facilities. We see that happening at the national scale. We see it happening in Georgia, and we also see it happening in this 14 county metropolitan Atlanta region. And so um, as we talk about exposure to pollutants that come from these um, different facilities, we've got to think about health effects, including reduced lung function, respiratory discomfort, exacerbation of chronic respiratory illnesses, and those vulnerable communities or populations are our senior citizens, children, people who already have respiratory and chronic diseases, um, as well as communities of color and low-income communities, which are living in closest proximity to these facilities. We can also talk about the urban heat island effect and its impact on places like Atlanta or other urban centers um, where uh, extreme heat tends to impact those populations, again, who have already been made to be vulnerable to a number of health risks and threats. Um, and then finally, with respect to urban flooding and coastal flooding for that matter, um, we know that there are short-term effects from flooding, including injury, exposure to disease-causing pathogens, exposure to mold and other toxic pollutants. Um, also in terms of um, the way that our water supplies are impacted, excessive rainfall facilitates the entry of human sewage and animal waste into waterways um, and to drinking water supplies. So this increases the risk of waterborne diseases. And then from a long-term effect, um, we've got to look at things like displacement, um, the fact that people lose their homes and property. And we've seen it happen in coastal areas like Savannah, um, and we see it happening in places like Atlanta as well. Um, and we cannot um, just overlook the, the mental stress and the mental health effects that are associated with experiencing these flood-related events um, or also things like heat waves um, that we expect to 
see more um, in this changing climate in Georgia. Um, so I'll stop there because I know that Lindsay will pick it up and talk about sort of this rural um, urban divide, um, how rural communities are impacted um, and we'll continue the conversation. Thank you, uh, Dr. Osborne Jelks. So we're, we're starting to frame a whole picture of Georgia, but we can't do that without exploring our relationship, our direct relationship with energy. And to do that, we have Chandra Arley from PSC. Chandra? Thank you, um, Felicia. So I'm unable to start my video, FYI, for um, our facilitators here. Um, Thank you. I got it. Okay. Okay, great. Thanks, everybody. So, yes, Chandra Farley, Just Energy Director at, at Partnership for Southern Equity. I'm just super um Honored to be here with all of these amazing women that um, I learn from every day. And Dr. Osborne Jelks, I think really, um, we just keep flowing into each other, but um, the, the quote from Dr. Bullard, I think is really where I wanted to start, which is the South. You know, we, we are here in the South and the South is a region that has been laid bare and, and stripped down by the racial um, and economic and class inequities due to the legacy of slavery. Um, and these societal barriers have really stripped our opportunities and um, for black communities, um, communities of color, rural and low wealth communities um, across the South to really lend their perspective to um, the shaping of our clean energy future uh, and decision-making in general. I was actually looking up um, ending poverty <laughs> last night and I was surprised to see that the UN includes in some of its definitions and descriptions of poverty indicators of that as lack of access to decision-making. And we know that when we talk about um, decision-making and equity, um, that decision-making is at the core. So our work at Partnership for Southern Equity as a racial equity organization um, is all about racial equity. And I always think it's good to ground us um, in a definition. We've had lots of conversation today and putting a couple together from Partnership for Southern Equity where we talk about um, that referring to what a genuinely non-racist society would look like. Um, our friends at Race Forward, which is a national racial equity organization, which we have been working with to create um, a racial equity impact assessment tool um, for City of Atlanta's clean energy plan, but also to support some of the other cities across the state that have committed to 100%, is that racial equity is a process. Um, it is a process of eliminating racial disparities and a process of improving outcomes for everyone. And it is the intentional and continual practice of changing policies, practices, systems, and structures by prioritizing measurable change in the lives of people of color. And I think that last point is, is critical um, because we should be able to, if we are um, accurately and authentically um, being grounded in the shared values of racial equity and intentionally and authentically working together to advance racial equity, we should be able to see some material changes. And again, when we, when we look at the South, um, the data is clear. Uh, the historically disinvested communities in the South bear a disproportionate burden of the negative impacts of our climate emergency um, and carbon-based energy production. Uh, the South experiences a higher frequency of billion dollar weather and climate disaster events than any other region. And <clears throat> from 2010 to 2020, 
Um, Georgia experienced 46 extreme weather events costing the state up to $20 billion um, in damages. And when we overlay that with the fact that the South is home to 84% of all US counties that experience persistent poverty, which is defined as a county that um, experiences poverty for three decades or more. Uh, and here in Georgia, we are home to 40 um, non-metro counties that are classified as persistent poverty counties. Um, we really begin to understand and contextualize what we are looking at and how that relates to energy. Uh, two of the biggest carbon polluters in the nation are, are in Georgia. Um, southern states rank at the bottom of lists for energy efficiency policies and programs um, that we know can reduce high energy burdens, which is the percentage of households, um, percentage of income spent on energy bills. Uh, when we rank at the top, um, Georgia, Alabama, New Orleans, Tennessee, some of these cities consistently rank at the top of rankings um, for states that host the highest energy burdens. And we know that um, if we look at Atlanta's largest metropolitan city here in Atlanta, racial equity is top of mind in energy for a reason. Um, black households, renters, which are generally majority black people and people of color or seniors, um, post energy burdens that are three, three and a half, sometimes four times that of white higher income households. Um, lots of research has, has been done on this. Um, and when we talk about the structural impacts of that, um, we have to go back to racist federal policy like redlining. We, we can trace everything back to um, the legacy of slavery. Um, even Dr. Denise Fairchild, um, who co-authored the book Energy Democracy, talks about um, the violent extraction of Africans from Africa to the South um, for forced um, labor. That was wind energy, right? They came on ships. Um, sun, you know, so all of these things that we, that the land, um, the original energy was us, you know, Black people's ancestors, Indigenous people's ancestors. So we have all of this historical legacy wrapped up in um, these historically extractive systems. So how do we flip these historic inequities um, into a forward thinking future? And what racial equity allows us to do, number one, which is really important, is to uh, grapple with that. We have to face the facts of how we got here. Uh, we have to get to the root cause um, and continue to engage in root cause analysis because we know if we never get to the root cause of why the weatherization assistance program, um, which is considered, you know, the flagship of, of the Department of Energy after 30 years, we still have um, people drowning, um, not just in high energy burdens, which is considered around 6%, but extreme energy poverty. Um, there's places in Mississippi where folks have energy burdens upwards of over 40%. Um, so when we talk about uh, you should only spend about 30% of your income on housing. Um, and if people are spending another 30 to 40% on their energy, that just doesn't leave much for food, gas, um, uh, all of those things. So when we are able to continue to root ourselves in the root causes and address those things at the root, then we can look at what something like a weatherization assistance program uh, which isn't helping move people out of poverty because if we're looking at energy costs, we've got to look at poverty and the fact that wages have remained flat for the last 30 years while the incomes, you know, for the wealthiest, even during COVID, who have made almost the trillion dollars um, during this pandemic disaster, we have to look at those things. So then we can look at something like weatherization and an opportunity for Georgia where instead of people who are suffering under high energy burdens um, are on 18 to 24 month waiting lists, have the opportunity to be trained in high road jobs to do this work. 
um, start weatherization and energy efficiency businesses, which in turn turns into small business development opportunities, which in turn is community wealth building opportunities. So looking at energy, poverty, um, this idea that poverty also speaks to a lack of being able to participate in the full spectrum of decision-making um, really goes back to some of the municipal decisions that we have talked about that are being made um, at the Public Service Commission, which I know Lindsay is going to talk about, at municipal utility commissions, in your electric membership cooperatives where we need more people running for these boards. Um, the decision-making um, is, is the key, making sure people who are first and most impacted um, by these disparities, by these inequities, by this systemic disenfranchisement um, can not just have their seat at the table, um, but engage in the full spectrum of decision-making um, for all of these decisions as leaders. Thank you. Thank you, Chandra. And so now to really tie it all together and to look at the impact of um, direct public policy in all that we're talking about, um, we have Lindsay Harper who's going to tie some of these dots and pieces together and then we'll move into a Q&A session. So um, Ms. Harper. Thank you, Felicia, and thank you to everyone here. This is an incredible panel to be a part of. Um, I'm really honored to uh, be standing on the shoulders on, and working with and, and standing next to these women on this panel uh, to have this conversation. Um, and so I'm just honored to be here. And so thank you to everybody. I, uh, my name is Lindsay Harper, she, hers. I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. And I'm national coordinator of Arm in Arm, where we're working to ignite a transformational era, ending the climate crisis, centering racial and economic justice. Um, I was, I'm honored to be a part of the original group that helped to develop Arm in Arm. And we uh, studied past uh, movements and, and act, actions and things that worked and things that did not work and kind of decided that what was needed in this moment to address the climate crisis was centering racial and economic justice. If the policies and the PhDs had all the answers, we wouldn't still be on the edge of a cliff. And so clearly we need to stop doing what we were doing and do something new. Um, I'll say that one of the things that I'm most proud of, uh, of the work that I do is being able to bring what's happening to Georgia into the national space. I think it's very important for folks who are, you know, in places that aren't necessarily living in the same kind of extractive energy economy that we have here in Georgia, but are making energy decisions for the nation, energy future decisions for the nation, need to understand what all that stuff up there like actually means on the ground. And so I'm, I'm honored to have been able to work with folks in the Neighborhood Planning Unit V community, uh, uh, which is here in Metro Atlanta, and also uh, Burke County residents. Uh, Burke County is home to the first new nuclear energy construction in this country in about 40 years, nuclear power plant Vogel. And no one seems to really be talking about Plant Vogel, um, not in the big spaces, not nearly enough. And so I try and rail and rail and rail on the, on the doors and walls and telling people that whatever, what's happening in Georgia, we cannot afford to recreate anywhere else. One of the things that I have learned from these wonderful women on this call and the work that I've been able to do is what energy burden really looks like. Um, what inequitable public spending really looks like. Um, you've got folks in Neighborhood Planning Unit V. I had an opportunity to do some civic engagement work there. I would show people my own energy bill and show them where they were being charged for nuclear power plant Vogel, sharing with them how the uh, Public Service Commission had allowed for additional fees to be tacked onto the, their bills. These are parents um, at the school where I was doing some work in Dunbar Elementary who had five, six, seven, eight hundred dollar bills. They were never able to get out from under the bills, regardless of the programs and the resources that were offered to them. These aren't really restorative measures to really make anyone whole. And so um, what I often say is that, you know, when you're talking about just the science, well, we can put the science of nuclear aside. We'll let's not talk about that right now. When you talk about the management of the project, the value statement that's being made by the Public Service Commission, which is an elected body, um, is, is one that has totally devalue the, even their own constituents. And so when you're talking about the management of this nuclear energy system in this state, the decisions that the Public Service Commission has made have, have directly destabilized Georgians. 
And let's stop and think about that before we start trying to replicate what's happening here anywhere, anywhere else. You have places in neighborhood planning unit B where folks have five, five six, seven, eight hundred dollar bills. And then, as I, as I say, across the nuclear spectrum, across the rural urban divide and places like Burke County, places like Savannah, which are downwind and downstream from both nuclear power plant Vogel and the Savannah River site. You know, we have to have these conversations about, you know, why is it that our region has been, you know, designated as, honestly, it seems like trash. Like, why are we garbage? Why is, why is it there are certain places have been designated as, as viable places to dump all these kinds of environmental, you know, health? This is something that I hold dearly, as many of us do. And I, what I find is that, you know, any climate movement that's happening right now, I wanna take a step back. Any climate movement right now in this country needs to be led, I feel, by someone who is like me, a woman of color, uh, you know, who's in the South, who understands what extractive energy really looks like, what inequitable public spending really looks like, what a militarized economy, one where we focus on guns and bombs and police and military, uh, you know, military and, and, and prison industrial complex versus healthy jobs, healthy environments, restorative policies, restorative energies that don't just take. Um, and I think that it's really important to, to talk about the importance of the decision-making, which was said earlier. If folks are not at the table or barred from being at the table, if policies are put into place so that people cannot participate to be at the table, that's not done. That's not on purpose. That's not by accident. And I think that it's time for us to turn around and just really say no and not participate in the things that hurt other people. We have to be honest with ourselves. And I think it comes to a place of really unlearning and deprogramming some of the racial uh, racial inequities, the white supremacy that all of us have internalized. Um, we have internalized oppression and often people don't feel that there's enough we don't have our imaginations, I feel, often don't allow us to imagine something much bigger, much better, much more healthy than we have now. Um, I do want to say just a couple of things before I wrap up, because I do know we only have so much time. But one thing that uh, Dr. Osborne Jelt said earlier, you know, we have data on our side. We have time on our side. We have our ancestors. We have our lived experiences on our side now. So we no longer, there's some conversations I don't think that we need to have anymore. I think it's very clear that the investments made in the environmental space for the last 50 some years have not been fruitful. There has not been an adequate ROI. Um, so I think that we, that's, that, is a, that is a fact now. That being said, I think it's also very important to, to share that facts are the enemy of truth. And I say that because it's really easy to see someone's name on an Excel spreadsheet and to be able to come up with an analysis. But the truth is not that simple. And if you think about it, our whole court system is based on a set of facts that you argue in either way. So I say is that to say that facts are the enemy of truth. So you can't always take things at face value, but your best bet is to go to the source, which are often the people who are not at the table. Um, and the last thing that I wanted to share is something I think is really important as we're thinking about all the various elements um, of the uh, fighting the climate crisis equation that has left us with basically zero still at the end is that, you know, we've been asking the wrong questions. Uh, Albert Einstein had a quote, I'm going to butcher it, but it's something to the effect that if he, if he had an hour to solve a problem, uh, an existential problem, that he would spend the first 55 minutes making sure that you're getting the question right. Because once you get the question right, then you can get the answer. And so it's a, it's, we have the data to be able to ask the right question. But what we need is a, is a frame of mind and people who are willing to change their minds to shift how they've been asking the question. So um, I'll stop there and I'm happy to answer any questions if folks have any, and also have some resources to share about Arm and Arm later. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Lindsay. Thank all of the panelists. This is, um, it's already amazing. I'm learning more each time everyone speaks. And I think now we're going to be joined Blackish style with everybody on camera or um, joined in. And I, I don't know what the status will be with microphones. And I have um, 
a couple of questions. Um, one, I'm going to put in the background, but I'll bring it around at the end. So my big question that I live my life by is if we get it right, what will it look like? So that's the question that I use that guides my work, my life, and when I have to stop and think deeply. I'm not going to put that out first. I'm going to start with, um, for many years, uh, many of us and the folks that I'm looking at and lots of people of color attached to the environmental justice movement, the environmental movement, we've worked really hard to get the civic, civil rights, and others involved in the environmental movement and in the environmental justice movement. And it occurs to me, listening to all the panelists, that perhaps we need to spend energy getting the environmental community on board with the human rights agenda. And I, I'm just wondering if any of our panelists just thinking about the conversation, that's the question that came to my mind. And I see Dr. McLean, your mic is off. So you wanna um, dive into that? Yeah, I do. Uh, there are, of course, the, the environmental justice movement is not that homogenous, you know, we all think and, and work alike. And so there have been those of us who have, from the very beginning, been talking about environmental justice in the framework of human rights, because it is our human right to breathe clean air. It is our human right to drink clean water, to have soil that you can grow your food in. Uh, it is even our right to fight to reduce the carbon footprint. So we're talking about, uh, and, and, Many of us took this fight from the national level to the international arena. We didn't just work in our local neighborhoods. We tried to participate at the UN level, both in New York and Geneva. We tried to participate in all the convention of the parties convenings. Those are the official government gatherings. We participated in the non-governmental convenings because you cannot talk about breathing and eating and good health without you talking about the overarching framework of human rights. Uh, Monique Harden uh, down in uh, New Orleans, who's now working with the Deep South Center for Environmental Justice has done a, a tremendous amount of work on placing the environmental justice movement right smack dab in the middle of, of the human rights uh, piece. Uh, and many of us, the, I would say the more progressive or the more radical ones of us, we have always, always partnered with and seen ourselves as a part of the civil rights movement, the justice movement, the all Black Lives Matter movement, any movement we could we try to integrate and be a part of, because let's, let's face it now, come on, let's be honest. It ain't but one movement. And that movement is for liberation. That movement is for self-determination. You can use equity all you want, but that's a train stop, some going someplace else. You can talk about the climate justice movement, the environmental justice movement, the environmental injustice movement, the environmental racism, all of that, all of that. Baby and fellow comrades, panelists, and listening audience, I'll tell you after 62 years of in the movement, ain't but one. And I don't care what country you're in or what, it's about liberation and self-determination, the right of people to decide for themselves, a right of people to participate in any decision that's gonna impact their lives on any level. So I, I love that question. And um, you know, you say, what we gonna do? We're in a, a universal cycle. And my mother used to always tell me, ain't no such thing as poverty reduction. She said, because poverty been with us since time began. So we have to think differently 
I don't have poverty reduction programs. I have pathways to prosperity programs. And there's a difference. So yes, the human rights movement is what we are looking for because we are born with those rights and to have to fight for them and have to produce document after document, report after report, data after data to prove this stuff is BS. So, so with that, um, we had a little bit of conversation about the intersection of COVID-19 and climate. And it seems to me is um, that COVID, this pandemic, kind of pulled the cover back, pull, pull, pulled, um, you know, shined light. And, and I'm wondering, Dr. Shafi, when you brought up looking at putting together that people are not inherently vulnerable, but in fact, they are made vulnerable. And then looking at the way in which the pandemic in the midst of uh, a struggle to really assert the legitimacy of climate change as a problem, how, how, how do you think those those um, come together in this moment to to say to kind of define how we might move forward. Thank you, uh, uh, Felicia. Indeed, uh, when you look at the when the, when you look at the uh, pandemic and the raid. Now we have the data because we have been saying that in EJ community that people are dying people are getting cancer, but then the delayed effect from exposure to the disease always prevented from forceful argument because they always alluded that to the uh, people eating more, or, you know, too many, too much fried food or smoke, or it's their lifestyle has nothing to do with being exposed. But I think what, as you correctly said, that it pulled the curtain. COVID, there is no delay. You see the effect. And if you look at the World Health Organization, say 7 million people die from air pollution every year. And the economic cost of that is about 5 trillion based on World Bank. And then you look at the uh, report that American Lung Association just released, uh, I think two days ago on April 21st, saying that uh, indeed 40% uh, of Americans are exposed to uh, you know, polluted air. But then they acknowledge that this is again, we are, it's not part of our DNA, but it is that people who are um, more, uh, you know, uh, communities of color tend to be exposed to more air pollutant than others. And again, uh, coming back to your report of uh, the air of justice in 2001, that people of color are more likely to live in highly polluted areas, uh, whether it is by coal power power plants. And then now look at the studies. There was a study by the Sunnis uh, uh, University and they looked at the, they used the data from 2014 of uh, EPA hazard, uh, you know, air pollutant, um, uh, hazardous air pollution. Uh, and then they matched it, I think it was EPA 2014 air, national air toxic uh, assessment. And they looked at it, uh, look at these pollutant, uh, the respiratory, uh, there is a respiratory hazard index. And then they correlated these the, the data on the pollution, air pollution, with the more than 3,000 um, counties, U.S. counties, and the death toll of COVID in those particular counties. And they saw that the higher the um, hazardous air pollution, the higher the mortality rate of um, COVID. So we know that, um, and this was published in Referee Journal recently. Then there was a particular matter study that Harvard uh, Teaching School did. And they looked at the only one, one air pollutant, which was the 
particulate matter 2.5, and they saw higher incidence of death and mortality, mortality and morbidity from COVID. So uh, we really need to put these together and then it will give us the picture of why, why climate is not an equalizer, why pandemic is not. And that's why I use the analog clock. If we don't look at the past, if we don't see where the future lays ahead, we are going to be stuck in this moment of digital clock. And that's my thank you. So now, now Excuse me, Felicia, would it be possible for me to add something briefly to that? I'm, I'm coming to, to, is it on the COVID? I, I was coming mm -hmm. back. Home. Yep. Okay, sure. So brief, just to illustrate how policies can make folks vulnerable. I wanted to mention earlier uh, that some of the decisions the Public Service Commission has made have destabilized Georgians. During the pandemic, they also decided to turn off the power to thousands of folks here in Georgia who were behind on their bills. So which further put them behind um, and made them even more vulnerable. You get behind on that stuff, you have to catch back up. So I just wanted to give an illustration of how that directly impacts people and you know people become vulnerable from those things. Excuse me. Definitely, and I'm coming back around to that as well. But I, I also wanted to ask, oftentimes, especially in urban centers, we have a problem, we have a problem like flooding. And so then it's okay, we have a solution for flooding. We're gonna create a park or we're gonna create a green area. We are going to solve. So we're not gonna look at how did this situation come about? We're just going to come with the latest, greatest solution. And it's, I'm curious as to whether or not those sorts of uh, drop in technological, even if, even if environmental, but even if green, but those sorts of solutions, what sort of impact does that tend to have on the local community? And I thought I'd go to Dr. Osborne jokes on that. Thank you for that question. I, I think even in how you asked the question, it kind of underscores what we've been talking about today, that we cannot separate um, the science or the solutions from looking at issues of equity and justice. So when you talk about, you know, parks and green space, uh, things like green infrastructure, um, which is being used right now in Atlanta to address um, issues of urban flooding, um, particularly in communities that have been made to be vulnerable on the west side of Atlanta in the Proctor Creek watershed, for, for example. Um, and while from a technical side or perspective, um, green infrastructure works. Um, it's something that will help to alleviate some of the flooding that communities face. Um, it is being used in, in other cities across the country as one tool to bolster the resilience of those communities. And so from a technical side, it does work. But if we're talking about putting that, the technical solution in the context of equity and justice, then we can't just, as you say, sort of drop it in. We've got to look at it from a policy perspective. To Dr. Shafi's points, we've got to think about coming out of the silos and working across sectors. So new parks, new green space, new green infrastructure sounds great. Um, but what will it do to those communities? Will it displace the communities that it is being um, perhaps implemented to to help? Um, and so if we're not looking at things from a policy perspective, if we're not looking at um, the potential for rising, you know, property values, the potential that people will be displaced by this green gentrification, then we're not really solving the problem, we're just shifting the problem you know, in terms of how those communities are impacted, we're just shifting things to a different area. Um, so the policy has to be, um, has to come into play. We have to be thinking about these principles of equity and justice as we are designing these fixes and approaches. Um, and without doing that, um, then perhaps we might address the issue from one perspective, but we haven't really solved what the, um, what the, what the true challenge is. So, so thank you for that. And, and now um, there's a lot of conversation about racial justice and um, racial justice lenses, uh, racial justice commitments, uh, racial justice forums, 
and all things seem, it, it seems that racial justice connects, especially in this country. So I, I'm coming to you, um, Chandra Farley, because um, racial justice, uh, PSE was kind of ahead of the curve in terms of the need to define justice and equity within the policy arena and within the South. And with a particular history that's particularly rooted here. So I'm curious, as, as we look at Georgia, climate change, and before we get to the energy bills and the individual impact, this framing around racial justice seems really important because there's a low income kind of piece, but there's a racial justice equity piece. And I'm wondering how um, PSE is really grappling with that and, and how you see pushing that out into the larger arena. Thank you, Felicia. I think that's, um, it's a really, it's a really good question. And I think that everything we have talked about here today demonstrates what we are talking about. Climate justice is racial justice. There, there is no climate justice without racial justice. There is no climate justice without economic justice and partnership for Southern equity. I think you can even look at the evolution of, of the organization um, celebrating 10 years um, this year, which a lot of people, you know, don't, don't realize, but even as, you know, when Nathaniel founded the organization, it, it was equity forward. It wasn't racial equity forward. The mission was actually changed um, in a, a number of years ago to be explicit about racial equity being the way to advance shared prosperity um, across Atlanta, Georgia, um, and the South. So I, I think that's important. I think also looking at um, everything that impacts racial and economic justice, right? So our, our key issue areas, PSE really started out in, in transportation, uh, which health, economy, um, Atlanta, <laughs> MARTA, you know, all, all of those things, um, looking at opportunity deferred, the work in Clayton County um, early on with the power of the penny campaign um, to restore transit, uh, you know, to, to, um, to, to Clayton County. So, and then that growing into the energy work. Um, it was our work in Cobb County around transportation where we found out about the big blow up um, with, with Cobb EMC um, a, number, a number of years ago, which really activated a community around trying to understand how does this happen? How do we have tens of millions of dollars in our name on a huge um, events facility and, and people are still struggling with, with their bills and who's making these decisions? So, you know, bringing all, of the, we all need some kind of inflection point. And um, to your point earlier, Felicia, around, um, the civic engagement piece, I think, is, is the other, what we're talking about being having access to the full spectrum of decision making. Partnership for Southern Equity's work at its core is about civic engagement and making sure people have, act, have the access, the information, the support to be their own advocates. So I went around a little bit, but you know, when we talk about justice, we can't have any of those things without being engaged in the in the decision making and being able to lead those processes, which then turns into equity as, as a strategic process, which is a vehicle to justice and ultimately liberation, as, as Dr. McLean shared. So so thank you. And and really rounding this out, and I've been um, wanting to come full circle to Lindsay, because you actually brought it down to the individual. You spoke about the power, like who needs to be in the leadership. So people often say BIPOC led, but you brought it all the way now to Southern Black female leadership. And at, at a particular time, as the, the quintessential folk with the experience, the perspective, the energy, the vision, um, all of that, and that, that we are the ones that are sensitive to not only the two, four, six hundred dollar water bill, but the fact there's folks right here in Atlanta that don't have water 
because that bill expired. They can't meet. And we also are the ones that know that a, a gallon of water can cost more than a gallon of gasoline. So keeping that in perspective. So in, in wrapping this all up, because I did see you, that you had a point to go with each of the points. And I thought that I would give our, our young dynamic sister uh, the, the mic to wrap it and bring it all together as we lean forward. So Lindsay Harper. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, I said the other day in a, in a, another conversation is that you are qualified. We are qualified. I think at the end of the day, people don't necessarily, because the policies and the PhDs have been in the rooms, making the decisions, have the titles and the money and the schools and the organizations behind them. People who know way more than the folks up at the top could ever know who have their grandmother, their great grandmother, they have all of these generations of, of, of experience to draw from, to add to our experience, our policy um, is not being used. So inefficient. This is an inefficient process. And so if it, the greatest value add I think is black women, women of color, speaking, speaking loudly. You know, there I've, I've learned myself as a black woman that I, there are privileges that I've had and I've learned how to use my privilege so that I can to get into a room, but perhaps to step aside so that someone else can come into that space and really speak truth to power, but treat power to power. That's another way that I think that it frames that makes a lot of sense as well. Um, and I just think that, yes, I agree, Mona Lisa, we need our black men to stand up as well. Um, we have some opportunities right now that people are actually listening. Um, white people are actually listening. It is more socially acceptable to talk about racism and white supremacy more than it ever has been before. The stars have aligned. Um, Reverend Durley always says that no one wants to lose, join a losing movement. This is something that we can win. And it's something that we can absolutely win if women, black women, women of color, young people, the formerly incarcerated, you know, immigrants, refugees come forward, stand together and be seen, be heard and be counted. Um, our uh, community elder, Annie Laura, uh, always says that, you know, you do your part. This is a really big, we have a lot to achieve. Dr. McLean, you've been at this for a long time. And I personally feel as though the stars are aligned and Annie Laura says, as long as you play your part, you play your part, we can win. This is spiritual warfare. She says, I'll be down here praying and y'all be up in the office typing on your computers. <laughs> but just play your part and just know that when, if you see a crack, put your foot in the door, and bust it open and say what you gotta say. And I'll just leave it there. Thank you. And we we are running out of time, but I'm just noticing being um, not the most responsible uh, moderator, but we did have two questions in the q and I don't know if everybody can read them. I hope they can, and because then I don't have to state them. Uh, federal state policies, do you think voting electorate fully understand what the Water Commission does? Uh, um, I'll answer the first question, probably not. The voting electorate collectively don't, don't understand much. And so, uh, no, but pay attention to people they're electing. This is true. Um, some of us are out there and we need to help them understand better. And this thought about how labor, particularly labor unions, fit into the questions of equity and so, um, um, liberation. Yeah, unions are very important. Um, you know, that, that organized labor push and for Black America, there would be no middle class without unions. So we love them, adore them. Labor gets things done. So we believe in work. This is work for us. Um, and I'm happy to join a union with all of these women. With that, because we have one minute and I'm on time, I thank all of the presenters. You guys were amazing. Uh, I think everybody that was in the audience, I always consider audience part of the presentation. And I do recognize the energy that you brought to the conversation. We felt it, we received it. We knew that there were some almost 200 of you tuning in for a conversation that you didn't even know where it would go. And with 
with that, I'm going to toss it back to totally wrap up. I will mention that we are going to carry this conversation forward. Um, we think it is um, perhaps the most important conversation in Georgia. And so we are committed to taking this page forward and we'll see how that evolves. And so now back to Leslie. Hello, everyone. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much to our great lineup of speakers today. And we would also like to thank you, all of the participants who were able to join us. We will be posting a recording of this webinar later this week on our website, as well as to the YouTube channel. And you will also receive a link in your email. Please make sure to follow, like, and subscribe on YouTube social, and all of our other social media channels. And let us know how we did today. So that link is going out to the survey in your email. And again, thank you so much for attending. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you.